For twelve years, you have been asking, Who is John Galt? This is John Galt speaking. I am the man who loves his life. I am the man who does not sacrifice his love or his values. I am the man who has deprived you of victims, and thus has destroyed your world. And if you wish to know why you are perishing, you who dread knowledge, I am the man who will now tell you. The chief engineer was the only one able to move. He ran to a television set and struggled frantically with its dials. But the screen remained empty. The speaker had not chosen to be seen. Only his voice filled the airways of the country, of the world, thought the chief engineer, sounding as if he were speaking here, in this room, not to a crew, but to one man. It was not the tone of addressing a meeting, but the tone of addressing a mind. You have heard it said that this is an age of moral crisis. You have said it yourself, half in fear, half in hope, that the words had no meaning. You have cried that man's sins are destroying the world, and you have cursed human nature for its unwillingness to practice the virtues you demanded. Since virtue, to you, consists of sacrifice, you have demanded more sacrifices at every successive disaster. In the name of a return to morality, you have sacrificed all those evils which you held as the cause of your plight. You have sacrificed justice to mercy. You have sacrificed independence to unity. You have sacrificed reason to faith. You have sacrificed wealth to need. You have sacrificed self-esteem to self-denial. You have sacrificed happiness to duty. You have destroyed all that which you held to be evil and achieved all that which you held to be good. Why, then, do you shrink in horror from the world around you? That world is not the product of your sins. It is the product and the image of your virtues. It is your moral ideal brought into reality in its full and final perfection. You have fought for it, you have dreamed of it, and you have wished it. And I, I am the man who has granted you your wish. Your ideal had an implacable enemy, which your code of morality was designed to destroy. I have withdrawn that enemy. I have taken it out of your way and out of your reach. I have removed the source of all those evils you were sacrificing one by one. I have ended your battle. I have stopped your motor. I have deprived your world of man's mind. Men do not live by the mind, you say. I have withdrawn those who do. The mind is impotent, you say. I have withdrawn those whose mind isn't. There are values higher than the mind, you say. I have withdrawn those for whom there aren't. While you were dragging to your sacrificial altars the man of justice, of independence, of reason, of wealth, of self-esteem, I beat you to it. I reached them first. I told them the nature of the game you were playing and the nature of the moral code of yours, which they had been too innocently generous to grasp. I showed them the way to live by another morality, mine. It is mine that they chose to follow. All the man you had banished, the man you hated yet dreaded to lose, it is I who have taken them away from you. Do not attempt to find us. We do not choose to be found. Do not cry that it is our duty to serve you. We do not recognize such duty. Do not cry that you need us. We do not consider need a claim. Do not cry that you own us. You don't. Do not beg us to return. We are on strike. We are the man of the mind. We are on strike against self-immolation. We are on strike against the creed of unearned rewards and unrewarded duties. We are on strike against the dogma that the pursuit of one's happiness is evil. We are on strike against the doctrine that life is guilt. There is a difference between our strike and all those you've practiced for centuries. 
Our strike consists not of making demands, but of granting them. We are evil according to your morality. We have chosen not to harm you any longer. We are useless according to your economics. We have chosen not to exploit you any longer. We are dangerous and to be shackled according to your politics. We have chosen not to endanger you, nor to wear the shackles any longer. We are only an illusion according to your philosophy. We have chosen not to blind you any longer and have left you free to face reality, the reality you wanted, the world as you see it now, the world without mind. We have granted you everything you demanded of us, we who had always been the givers, but have only now understood it. We have no demands to present to you, no terms to bargain about, no compromises to reach. You have nothing to offer us. We do not need you. Are you now crying, no, this was not what you wanted? A mindless world of ruins was not your goal? You did not want us to leave you? You moral cannibals, I know that you always know what it is that you wanted. But your game is up. Because now we know it too. Through centuries of scourges and disasters, brought about by your code of morality, you have cried that your code had been broken that the scourges were punishment for breaking it, that men were too weak and too selfish to spill all the blood it required. You damned man, you damned existence, you damned this earth, but never dared to question your code. Your victims took the blame and struggled on, with your curses as a reward for their martyrdom, while you went on crying that your code was noble, but human nature was not good enough to practice it. And no one rose and asked the question, Good? By what standard? You wanted to know John Galt's identity. I am the man who has asked that question. Yes, this is an age of moral crisis. Yes, you are bearing punishment for your evil. But it is not man that is now on trial. And it is not human nature that will take the plane. It is your moral code that's through this time. Your moral code has reached its climax, the blind alley at the end of its course. And if you wish to go on living, what you now need is not a return to morality, you who have never known any, but to discover it. You have heard no concepts of morality but the mystical or the social. You've been taught that morality is a code of behavior imposed upon you by whim, the whim of a supernatural power or the whim of society, to serve God's purpose or your neighbor's welfare, to please an authority beyond the grave or else next door, but not to serve your life or pleasure. Your pleasure, you've been taught, is to be found in immorality. Your interests would best be served by evil. And any moral code must be designed not for you, but against you. Not to further your life, but to drain it. For centuries, the battle of morality was fought between those who claimed that your life belongs to God and those who claimed that it belongs to your neighbors. Between those who preach that the good is self-sacrifice for the sake of ghosts in heaven and those who preach that the good is self-sacrifice for the sake of incompetence on earth. And no one came to say that your life belongs to you and that the good is to live it. Both sides agreed that morality demands the surrender of your self-interest and of your mind. That the moral and the practical are opposites. That morality is not the province of reason, but the province of faith and force. Both sides agreed that no rational morality is possible that there is no right or wrong in reason, that in reason there is no reason to be moral. Whatever else they fought about, it was against man's mind that all your moralists have stood united. It was man's mind that all their schemes and systems were intended to despoil and destroy. Now choose to perish 
or to learn that the anti mind is the anti life. Man's mind is a basic tool of survival. Life is given to him, survival is not. His body is given to him, its sustenance is not. His mind is given to him, its content is not. To remain alive, he must act. And before he can act, he must know the nature and the purpose of his action. He cannot obtain food without a knowledge of food and of the way to obtain it. He cannot dig a ditch or build a cyclotron without a knowledge of his aim and of the means to achieve it. To remain alive, he must think. But to think is an act of choice. The key to what you so recklessly call human nature, the open secret you live with, yet dread to name, is the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness. Reason does not work automatically. Thinking is not a mechanical process. The connections of logic are not made by instinct. The function of your stomach, lungs or heart are automatic. The function of your mind is not. In any hour and issue of your life, you're free to think or to evade that effort. But you're not free to escape from your nature, from the fact that reason is your means of survival, so that for you, who are a human being, a question to be or not to be is the question to think or not to think. A being of volitional consciousness has no automatic course of behavior. He needs a code of values to guide his actions. Value is that which one acts to gain and keep. Virtue is the action by which one gains and keeps it. Value presupposes an answer to the question of value to whom and for what. Value presupposes a standard, a purpose, the necessity of action in the face of an alternative. Where there are no alternatives, no values are possible. There is only one fundamental alternative in the universe, existence or non-existence, and it pertains to a single class of entities, to living organisms. The existence of inanimate matter is unconditional. The existence of life is not. It depends on a specific course of action. Matter is indestructible. It changes its forms, but it cannot cease to exist. It is only a living organism that faces a constant alternative, the issue of life or death. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. If an organism fails in that action, it dies. Its chemical elements remain, but its life goes out of existence. It is only the concept of life that makes the concept of values possible. It is only to a living entity that things can be good or evil. A plant must feed itself in order to live. The sunlight, the water, the chemicals it needs are the values its nature has set to its pursuit. Its life is the standard of value directing its actions. But a plant has no choice of action. There are alternatives in the conditions it encounters, but there is no alternative in its function. It acts automatically to further its life. It cannot act for its own destruction. An animal is equipped for sustaining its life. Its senses provide it with an automatic code of action, an automatic knowledge of what is good for it or evil. It has no power to extend its knowledge or to evade it. In conditions where its knowledge proves inadequate, it dies. But so long as it lives, it acts on its knowledge with automatic safety and no power of choice. It is unable to ignore its own good, unable to decide to choose the evil and act as its own destroyer. Man has no automatic code of survival. His particular distinction from all the other living species is the necessity to act in the face of alternatives by means of volitional choice. He has no automatic knowledge of what is good for him or evil, what values his life depends on, what course of action it requires. Are you prattling about an instinct of self-preservation, 
an instinct of self-preservation is precisely what man does not possess. An instinct is an unerring and automatic form of knowledge. A desire is not an instinct. A desire to live does not give you the knowledge required for living. And even man's desire to live is not automatic. Your secret evil today is that that is the desire you do not hold. Your fear of death is not a love of life and will not give you the knowledge needed to keep it. Man must obtain his knowledge and choose his actions by a process of thinking, which nature will not force him to perform. Man has the power to act as his own destroyer, and that is the way he has acted through most of history. A living entity that regarded its means of survival as evil would not survive. A plant that struggled to mangle its roots, a bird that fought to break its wings, would not remain for long in the existence they afforded. But the history of man has been a struggle to deny and to destroy the mind. Man has been called a rational being, but rationality is a matter of choice. And the alternative his nature offers him is rational being or a suicidal animal. Man has to be man by choice. He has to hold his life as a value by a choice. He has to learn to sustain it by choice. He has to discover the values it requires and practice his virtues by choice. A code of values accepted by choice is a code of morality.